it's Adam from Pixel, and welcome back. Now, if you followed my channel for any length of time, then you're probably well aware of the fact that one of my favorite topics to explore and to ponder is you, my fellow human, sharing this little blue dot in the middle of nowhere with me. And one of the topics that, that fascinates me the most is what motivates us, inspires us, what gets us up in the morning with a hunger to grow and to produce art. And I find that this is a topic that, that impacts us as artists more than a lot of people because of how much of ourself, our emotional state affects our productivity. It's not just a job that we can do. It's a job that we have to feel. So it requires us to master a lot more than just our intellectual selves, our personal selves, our emotional selves, our spiritual selves. We all have to, we have to have all of that in check in order to really find that groove and that flow to produce. And I've had the honor and the pleasure to have in-depth and wonderful conversations with some of the best of us out there, some of the most talented, some of the most inspired, some of the most famous artists out there who've got decades of experience over my own. And I find it very enlightening and eye-opening how open and willing they are to very often express that they struggle as much as I do very often to find this motivation, that they're not just these, these machines churning out inspiration every single day. Despite what we might believe in social media, where we see people being endlessly productive and producing five paintings a day, and they're all masterpieces. The gross majority of us, I think, are a lot more human than that. <laughs> in fact, I would argue that we are all more human than that. But we, we don't share those feelings. We don't share that, that flaw that we feel we have with everybody else. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about what it is that creates desire, what it is that creates motivation. And a very good way of starting this topic is to talk about video games, something that's been around for a long time now. When I was a young kid, it was a very fresh new thing that adults and parents hated watching their kids do. But I think it's safe to say that they've become a mainstay. They've become a very constant part of our life. And it's not going anywhere. It has grown exponentially every single year since my early days of video games where I played, you know, arcade games where we had like Asteroids and Zaxxon and, and Space Invaders. And then that evolved into consoles where we consoles got more and more powerful. And throughout this entire evolution of console gaming and arcade gaming and PC gaming and all these different facets of gaming, it never ceased to be fun. It never ceases to motivate. I have never sat down with a remote control in my hand and thought to myself, Ugh, another day of this crap. <laughs> it just, it's always fun. It's always engaging. Now, there are logical reasons, particularly if you're talking to an artist, why uh, somebody like me or you might be attracted to video games. I mean, we're playing fantasy characters and creatures and worlds that wouldn't otherwise exist with beautiful musical scores and epic weapons and and incredible challenges to face and, and epic monsters. But there's more to it than that because I find that there are some games that drag me in and I and I can't forget that that really that make me want to stay up till three four o'clock in the morning and continue playing despite despite my 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 wiser self telling me that i need to get my sleep and other games that i play for about half an hour and i go meh and i put it down which games have pulled me in well if i think about it games like well of course the soul series like dark souls and bloodborne and sekiro or uh, horizon zero dawn or back in the day funny saying that now but world of warcraft a game that i pick up and put down every now and then but a game at a certain at one point in my life i played all the time i completely obsessed over that game i could i could i could dump hours into that game and if you think about it objectively 
what were the odds that I was dealing with? For instance, playing World of Warcraft when I was raiding with my guild and stuff like that. Back when it was 40 man molten core raids and it would take two hours to get a raid together and we'd have to pug, pick up group, half of them because we didn't have enough people online in the guild to play the, to do the raid at the time. And some hunter would wipe the raid and half of them would leave and we'd have to wait another hour for them to come back. And then we'd finally grind our way through this, this grueling, punishing these mobs just to get to the first boss. And then we make 20 attempts at the first boss and half of the raid leaves and we have to get them all back again and then go through the trash mobs again and then finally get that boss down. And there's this jubilation, there's this euphoria when we finally get the boss down. And then one in a hundred chances that a piece of gear that your class needs drops in a raid of 40 people and your heart jumps out of your chest and you go, oh my God, it's the, sh it's the pauldrons that I wanted. But there's eight hunters in your group or eight warlocks in your group and you all have to roll on it. And there's a one in one in a hundred chance that you're actually going to get that. And you lose and you don't get it. And you walk away frustrated and exhausted and defeated. And then the next week you're back at it again and again and again until maybe one day you get it. Why? Why would I put myself through that abuse? Why would I make 600 attempts at the first boss, Gundir in Dark Souls 3? Why the hell would I put myself through that kind of abuse? For what? For a couple of souls and a key to open a door to just keep on doing it again and keep getting my ass handed to me over and over and over again? Somehow, something about those games kept me coming back to face those challenges. Not only face those challenges, but face the challenges despite the fact that I wanted to snap my remote control in half. Despite the fact that I was cursing and screaming out loud because I was so pissed off that that freaking... Oh, don't even get me started. But then when we sit down to draw, sometimes despite not having any of those... Well, apparently not having any of those challenges we have a much harder time to pick up that paintbrush and just produce and just make something of that day. Now, you could say, of course, the scientists would say, and to, to, in, in many ways uh, accurately say that, yeah, video games are made to kind of trigger endorphin releases in the brain and everything like that. And they, some games uh, are a little bit less ethical than others where they, you know, they try to tap into the addictive qualities of these games very triggering kind of qualities that keep you coming back over and over again. But there's more to it than that. There's something in that challenge that keeps you moving forward. Like, take it for instance, downing the first boss. Defeating the first boss, Gundir in Dark Souls 3. Whether you play video games or not is completely irrelevant. But you defeat that boss. What keeps you going after that? You've already defeated him. Well, there's another boss and another boss and another boss. Okay, so there's these little mini achievements along the way. Why do we keep going? Why are we why are we pushing forward through all of that? What's the point of it? Well, the point of it is that there's an end goal. There's some great discovery, there's some great achievement, there's some great story we're going to reveal at the end of all of that, right? And in most games, most, you know, most games that are maybe a little bit less inspired where the, where the writers kind of ran out of purpose in the writing and just kind of said, okay, let's just put a cap on it eventually. There's a big badass final boss that we have to defeat, that we have to take down and, and, you know, then the credits roll and the music plays and there's this cutscene of us walking off into the sunset as, as heroes. If you look at a game like Dark Souls, however, then there's no real big reward at the end. You sit down at your bonfire or you sit down on your throne and the lights go out and it's game over. You take your place in this world as you roll and the credits roll. There's no big epic ending to it. It's just you're there. You've found your purpose. And that's my favorite kind of ending. It's not epic. There's no big boss. There's no big 
there's no big explosion at the end of this big at this big journey it's you've just discovered your purpose you've discovered yourself and you sit down and you take your place and it doesn't need to be big it doesn't need to be spectacular i like i love in fact the lack of bling at the end of that game because in my humble opinion i think that miyazaki truly understands what the purpose of life is in a sense it's a very simple very slow very challenging discovery of self of purpose and when it comes to your artistic journey i think that one of the things that we tend to misinterpret about ourselves as artists as people is that life in and of itself who you are what your purpose is is really our crowning achievement it's your discovery of self and the older i get and the more i discover who i am the more it starts to make sense to me of why i'm here in the first place and i realize more importantly that being myself is not an epic explosive mind-blowing light shining experience it's in fact quite the opposite i discover more and more how simple i am how unremarkable i am i start to discover and come to terms with the fact that it's the simplicity of who i am the smallness of who i am that makes me special and it's that same when i discover and i see that simpleness that commonality that everyday person in the people i speak to where i truly find the closest connections to other people because i'm not looking at them or myself waiting for that big epic aha moment instead i look at them i look at you and i see you in all of your wonderfulness in all of your plainness in the fact that you don't spend every moment of your life climbing mountains sometimes you just sit on your ass and do nothing and one of the most important things that i've spoken about in the past that i learned was when i was at my lowest when i was at my darkest when i felt my most defeated it was only at that point that i realized that there was no big epic explosive end to who i was that this big expectation this this hope on what i would become was destroyed there was, and that what was destroyed ultimately was my sense of grandeur my ego and once that ego of mine was destroyed when it, once it was ruined and stepped on and shoved into a gutter that i realized that who i am at my most fundamental simple core is and always has been enough because it was that that i truly was and once i discovered my true purpose once i discovered who i truly was as just an organic human being just like everybody else without any epic conclusions to who i am that i realized that if i was to find any growth or inspiration or motivation in my life that it wasn't in what i could achieve or what i could prove myself as being but more importantly how i could help others instead that that me as a vessel as a package is small and does not have a lot of space for expansion within myself i can only make myself appear as big as i possibly can but i will only ever be a human being i will only ever be a single person and the only way for me to expand is not to expand through myself but to expand through others through how i influence others through how i help other people feel through how i help other people grow it's in my service to other people that i find the greatest sense of growth and achievement and what i realize in my life and what i hope that you will slowly discover in yours if you haven't already is the fact that your achievements are not the achievements of what you achieve for yourself your achievements are what you achieve in others i find probably one of the most 
fascinating and inspiring roles that I could possibly play is that of a teacher. Because for me, it wakes me up every single day with a sense of purpose that I can take everything that I am and help somebody else grow with it. That I have experiences and lessons that I've learned in my life through good and bad that I can help other people get through their struggles with as well. One of the things that I learned playing World of Warcraft back when I was doing all those gruelingly difficult, endless, tireless raids was the guilds that succeeded, the raids that succeeded and made the most progress were the ones that learned along the way that outperforming their fellow players was not the way to succeed. It was the raids that realized, it was the guilds that realized that in order for them to succeed, they needed to be at the service of the ones next to them. Their job wasn't to outperform everybody else. It was to make everybody else perform better. It was to do what they used, what tools they had to make other people grow. So how does that translate into your art? How does that translate into something that will get you up in the morning to motivate you to move forward? Well, there's two parts to it. The first part is the fundamentals. The first part is the tool. You need the tool to be able to perform. So the tool is learning about anatomy, value, color, composition, visual storytelling, line, three-dimensional form, etc. And you want to spend your life, you want to dedicate your time and training towards developing that tool. And once you've developed that tool to a point where you feel confident with it, where you feel like you can start to communicate fluidly with it, it's at that point that you can very often start to find your lack of motivation because you're thinking to yourself, that's when you'll start thinking to yourself at this point, well, I've already gotten really good at drawing. What the hell do I do next? And because you lose that sense of purpose, you lose that sense of motivation. You don't know what to do with that skill that you've got. I can draw awesome drawings, but where's the substance in that? And that's very often where artists very often at that pivotal point in their life where they either drop it or make a discovery. If you find you're at that point in your life where you've developed your skill to a very acceptable or even excellent point, or you're on your way there and you're wondering what's coming next, I can guarantee you that if your only desire in life is to produce art that will deify you, if, you're, if your only desire is to produce art that is so beautiful that the world around you will drop to their knees and worship you as the god of everything beautiful and fantastic, rest assured that even if you do achieve that, the joy you'll, you'll receive from that that reaction you get from other people will last you about a day and a half at most. After that, your purpose will shift from giving and sharing and offering something to your audience to trying to maintain that fame. And that's when people very often lose that motivation. If all you've got, if all your, if your only purpose in life is to be worshipped, even worship will get very boring and stale very quickly. Instead, ask yourself the question, now that I've got this talent, now that I've got this skill, how can I use this skill to bring some kind of value to my audience? And you have to ask yourself, who am I and what kind of value can I bring to others through my art? If you're at that point in your career where you feel that your skill has reached a level where you can start to communicate in a very confident way, where imagery is something you're really starting to master. But now you're trying to discover that greater purpose of yourself as an artist. Something substantial. Something that goes far beyond adoration from your fellow artists. Because you're realizing that now that you are adored by your fellow artists, there's that, that, that joy that that inspiration is starting to fade away because, well, you achieved that goal. Now what? But you're having a little bit of an existential crisis because you have no clue what value you have to share. 
The reason why you might be struggling to find your sense of self is because you're thinking that that big, that big magical explosive end boss thing that you're sharing with your audience doesn't exist. Stop looking and stop trying to create an explosive end boss experience. Realize that that thing that you are very likely on this planet to share with your art is not big and epic and explosive. It's simple, it's personal, and it's sincere. Maybe it's sharing little spooky stories to creep out the kids. Maybe it's creating imagery that taps into your empathy for fellow people. Maybe it's taking an angle or sharing a side of a story of something that helps to expose their humanity and shares your inner thoughts and feelings about a certain topic. Maybe it's your way of capturing the way love feels, or maybe it's your way of capturing some deep visceral feeling inside of us that you want to expose to your audience in a very raw way, like the way Del Toro will, for instance. If we use that Dark Souls analogy, that end game experience of sitting down on a throne or by a shrine very quietly, very unepically, and the screen fades to black and the credits roll, that is very much an analogy for what real life is. That purpose, that sense of self, that discovery of who you are in your beauty and your simplicity on who you truly are on a day-to-day -day level, not your Instagram self, your true self, the one who might be sitting down eating a piece of raisin bread right now with cream cheese, God only knows, has lived an entire life of complexity, of mundane, of exciting, of boring, of happiness and fulfillment and loneliness. And it is in that simple complexity of who you are that as an artist, you slowly discover and tap into and express to your audience. And one of the things that I find very enlightening and very inspiring for me is when I sit down and have a conversation with these master artists, some of which are students I'm, I have the honor of teaching right now. It's their simplicity and their humility that make them so approachable and relatable and appreciated. They have discovered far more than myself what their true self is. And when I sit down and share that space with them, I cease to feel like I need to impress them. And I instead feel appreciated in their presence. And your art is a way of letting other people know that there is a place and a time for everybody. And it's your job to create that little world for them to enjoy. All right. So with that said, I love you all with all my heart and happy painting. Take care. <laughs>